This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Late last year, the Hartford Police Department received a grant to expand their surveillance program. They plan to install more street-level cameras and employ two high-powered drones. With lawmakers struggling to keep up with the pace of new surveillance technology, should Hartford residents be concerned? Coming up, we'll be joined by Deputy Chief of the Hartford Police Department, Brian Foley, and Melvin Medina of the ACLU of Connecticut. We'll talk about how drones may be able to help law enforcement. We'll also consider the privacy concerns this technology raises in communities. Now, how do you feel about drones being used by police? You can join the conversation. The number, 860-275-7266. Email where we live at wmpr.org. And as always, find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. First joining uh, me now is Ben Powers. He's a freelance journalist and recently wrote a story, or last year wrote a story, about how a certain police department in Baltimore used surveillance technology. Ben, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So we, before we start off, uh, we're, this whole show is based on drones, and if you could define that for us when we talk about them. <laughs> yeah, I think that's uh, something that, you know, drone is just kind of the colloquial word we use, to, which expands to a whole range of different pieces of equipment, right? I mean, generally, they're unmanned, radio-controlled aircraft that can be used for everything from reconnaissance to bombing. And they're also often referred to as UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, or RPASs, so remotely piloted aerial systems. But the thing is, this sort of expands from everything to the MQ-9 Reaper drone, which is perhaps what most Americans are familiar with and which is quite heavily used by the military, to things as common as quadcopters, which are sort of the commercial drones that, you know, you might just be able to buy online or in a store that's sort of a small body with about four propellers on each corner. So drones encompasses all of these, but those are the sorts of things that we're referring to in this area. So lots of acronyms to describe uh, this technology, uh, widely used by the military, but we're now seeing uh, local law enforcement agencies around the country uh, buying drones. Specifically, your story looked at uh, the city of Baltimore, where the police department there used military-grade surveillance. How's that different from, say, a consumer drone or a we have some lower-end drone that a, a police department in another part of the country might be purchasing? Yes. Yeah, so what I really looked at in Baltimore and tried to kind of tease out was, you know, after, after Ferguson and a number of other sort of protests, we saw a heavy use of militarized police equipment. So this was, you know, heavily armored vehicles, uh, body armor, these sorts of things that really differed from what Americans were traditionally thinking of when they you know, thought of how you might encounter police in a day to day environment. But what gets much less scrutiny is perhaps much less visible is the way that military surveillance technology that was perfected sort of overseas in war zones is then brought to bear on U.S. citizens. And so what kind of, you know, I was looking at in Baltimore particularly was persistent surveillance systems in a program that was conducted there in Baltimore in 2016. Now, what this was, was a program that, you know, was able to surveil large areas of the city for hours on end. It consisted of taking an array of cameras and putting it on a sort of small aircraft and then flying that aircraft for a number of hours over the city. And what it did is it would take a photo every second that was up there and then beam that down to a command center on the ground. So what this was doing was creating a sort of real-time map that officers could look at and go back and see where somebody was two hours ago, sort of trace a car throughout the city. And, you know, what's kind of really amazing about it is it was capturing 30 square miles at a time. So this wasn't, you know, just a city block or something like that. This was a large part of Baltimore itself. And so looking at that, you know, they conducted 314 hours of surveillance over the city. It was deployed 98 times and captured more than a million images. So this was really a kind of a very robust surveillance program that we haven't seen in other American cities. But this is something that has been developed and has been trialed. Now, this is quite different from, you know, most law enforcement agencies. A lot of law enforcement agencies do use things such as quadcopters. They're not going to be flying an MQ-9 over your city. Uh, more often than not. But this is sort of, you know, this is where the debate goes. It's, you know, we open ourselves up to using things like drones for policing. It can be ratcheted up in a variety of different ways. Now, Ben, the controversy with this particular program that you and others have reported on is that the city of Baltimore residents and even the mayor uh, didn't even know that the city police department was using this technology. Yeah, that was a large part of it. It was through the uh, 
Baltimore Community Foundation, there was a grant given by philanthropists to this foundation, and then that money was then given to the police department to use to fund this program. And because it wasn't part of the budget appropriations process, the the mayor, local city council, nobody were, was aware that this was even happening until uh, Bloomberg broke this story in August of 2016. Well, how did the police department uh, explain uh, why this technology was being used without anyone knowing? Well, it's they've pretty consistently said that it's just the logical extension of their, uh, you know, the use of city cameras and, and street level cameras. That this is just sort of putting this up in the air. And they've really, you know, not not seen it as a sort of egregious example or, or oversight to not inform, you know, local politicians or create a, a terms of use that had public input and a variety of other things. And that's, you know, that's troubling because that shows that there really isn't a divide in how police see these two, these two sorts of things. And they really are quite distinct in how they're being used and the amount and level of scrutiny that they should receive. And this, again, was a program that was funded by private donation, uh, not uh, taxpayer money. Uh, so what was uh, the response uh, to this technology? And when we look at police using this type of technology, was it making an impact on crime on the streets in the city of Baltimore? Yeah, so in terms of the crime statistics, right, I think it's very hard to kind of attribute uh, any shift in those things to one specific variable. Um, you know, there's a variety of factors that go into this. But, you know, Baltimore, this was kind of pulled in after Baltimore saw a rising crime after the, the death of Freddie Gray in 2015. And so this was really a response to that. That being said, you know, Baltimore, unfortunately, has seen high levels of crime in 2016 and 2017. So while I think it's, you know, it's, it's not quite fair to say that this had a direct effect on crime one way or the other, uh, it, it really is, you know, shows the extent to which police are trying to utilize these sorts of technologies. And when it comes to people on the ground, you know, I talked to a number of people when I was reporting this out in Baltimore, and some of, they were pretty shocked that this was going on. They were a little bit more shocked that, uh, you know, local officials didn't know that this was even being conducted. And one, one, you know, activist and individual termed it to me as, you know, he says this is really just how the police see us as sort of enemy combatants. Um, and that's their view of how they're being used, particularly when it's military-grade tech that's brought to bear on them. And so there was a lot of, you know, uh, distrust there. And, I mean, unfortunately, this is a problem that Baltimore has had for a while now. There was a Department of Justice report that was coming out around this time as well that found, you know, systemic abuses of power uh, in that police department. And so this was just sort of part and parcel. And unfortunately, you know, people, perhaps they, they kind of wish they were more surprised, but this seemed part of the course of how their interactions with police had gone at that time. This is where we live. On the phone with us is Ben Powers, a freelance journalist who wrote a story for the Rolling Stone about how the city of Baltimore Police Department used specific military-grade uh, equipment technology to surveil uh, the city of Baltimore. We're talking about uh, this particular uh, story and a wider show about how surveillance technology is growing, and there's different types of technology that lo local law enforcement is using. Later on, we're going to hear from the city of Hartford, uh, where uh, they just uh, were approved to use uh, state money to buy more cameras and two drones to help deal with quality of life issues uh, in the city. And we're going to hear from the opposite side uh, of people worried about civil liberty protections. That's coming up on Where We Live. Now, uh, Ben, again, this is a very extreme example. I don't think there are, have been any other cities that have used this particular type of technology other than uh, the city of Baltimore. But are, are there plans to, are other cities interested in it? Or has the outcry uh, caused, uh, um, you know, law enforcement? to think a little closer about what kind of technology they should be using. Yeah, I mean, the technology was, you know, initially used in, a, in Iraq. It was called Operation Angel Fire, and that's what it was sort of initially developed for. And then when the developer took that, he started a private company called Persistent Surveillance Systems. So the technology was also used in Juarez, Mexico, initially for sort of similar purposes, and that was used to uh, track drug cartels there. And then, you know, there were, there were talks with a, a number of different police stations about using this, right? There was, a, I believe, in Dayton, Ohio, where the company is based, there were talks about using a trial program there as well, but that was met with kind of swift public opposition and, you know, sort of quickly, quickly halted. Um, 
but you know, I think this is this is just kind of it is an extreme example. You know, most most police departments might not be have the funding to run this sort of program, or they might not be able to get over the public pushback. Uh, but it does show a willingness to kind of take these things on. And you know, and particularly in Baltimore as well, there were also uses of things like stingrays, which are sort of cell phone sight simulators that sort of function as a fake cell phone tower and allow police to track people's phones and disrupt phone calls in a certain area. And then there was also sort of geolocation-based social media tracking that was used in coupling that with facial recognition to identify people in real time based on their social media profiles. And, you know, in some of the protests after the death of Freddie Gray, this was used to actively sort of arrest people in the crowd. And those two things, those aren't as extreme as one might think, you know. I mean, geophedia and, you know, facial recognition, these sorts of things have been used in places like San Jose and Oakland and Fresno. So they're more widespread. It's just sort of we don't know about them, right? And I think similarly to uh, recent concerns around like Facebook and how our data has been used in those ways, people are having a little bit better understanding or, or I guess caution around how their data is being used. And that's something that we do really want to take into account and in thinking through sort of how these police technologies come to bear on us and then what they end up being used for even after perhaps footage is taken and stored. Where does it go after that, for example? Now, Ben, do we know how many police departments in the U.S. have are using or are requesting drones? And I think you've done some reporting or looked into what Police One, an industry website, has proposed and um, how drones should be uh, used or, or purchased in 2018. Yeah, so as of 2017, according to a report for the Center for the Study of the Drone, um, there's at least 347 state and local police, sheriff, fire, and emergency units in the U.S. Have that have acquired drones. Um, now, you know, consumer drones are the most common of these. Like I was saying, these are quadcopter things, not a, not a Reaper drone. But local law enforcement departments do lead public safety drone acquisitions. And according to surveys done by Police One, and they put together a 2018 report on, you know, how best to use drones for policing, and then also kind of put together a, a bulleted point and list of how to best get communities to accept the use of drones as well. Um, some of the top uses for it include tracking missing people, you know, natural disaster responses and assessments, uh, SWAT response, and then also crime and traffic, ac- traffic accident scene analysis. Now, Ben, uh, before we let you go, we started off the, the uh, segment talking about, uh, again, this uh, extreme example of surveillance technology used by uh, the city of Baltimore Police Department. What's the status of that program today? Well, that program had been suspended. Uh, it, it, you know, I think uh, the police foundation came out with a report about it, uh, I believe, early earlier or early last year. Um, So that has been stopped. And I haven't seen thus far any instances of it popping up since then. I think there has been a lot of criticism of the program and a lot of skepticism of it. So I I would venture to say that we might not see it sort of pop again. But once again, you know, it's when it's not funded through public dollars and it's not made aware to public officials through a budget appropriation process, we really don't know unless there's reporting done on it. Because police department, you know, particularly in Baltimore, at least, didn't tell anybody about this. And I think also it's just worth mentioning in terms of thinking through this, you know, what are some of the second and third degree effects of using drones in this way? I mean, for example, in North Dakota, you know, there was legislation passed that allowed police departments to equip drones with non-lethal weapons, you know, such as tasers, tear gas, and rubber bullets. This was in 2015. And then in 2016, you know, Dallas police used a a bomb-diffusing robot to deliver ordinances to a a shooting suspect and then, you know, explode those ordinances. And so really, you know, a lot of these things we say, yes, they're great. They're being used in sort of tactical support roles. They're being used in observatory capacities. But we really do want to consider how they might be used in the future and then have legislation that really governs the ways in which they can be used. And so having a strong dialogue about that, I think, is really the next step when we're considering these issues. And we'll be talking more about how lawmakers should be debating this issue. And later on, we'll be hearing from the Center for the Study of the Drone at Bard College and how communities are responding to creating policies around, again, surveillance technology and drones. I want to thank Ben Powers, a freelance journalist, uh, for your time. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, the city of Hartford has approved a surveillance program for its police department that includes installing more cameras in neighborhoods and using two drones later this year. We'll find out more and hear why some residents of the city and others think it's not a good idea. What's your take? We want to hear from you. Join the conversation, 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We just heard about the questions lawmakers and citizens raised in the city of Baltimore over, over an extreme surveillance program used there by the Baltimore Police Department. Now, uh, last year, the Hartford City Council approved a program uh, to use state funds to purchase additional cameras for neighborhoods and two drones for the city of Hartford Police Department to use. Now, for more on why this type of surveillance program is needed in Connecticut's capital city, joining me in studio is Brian Foley. Deputy Chief of the Hartford Police Department. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Lucy. Thank you so much for having me on. Also in studio with us is Melvin Medina. He's Director of Strategic Initiatives at the ACLU of Connecticut. We'll be hearing from Melvin in a few minutes. Thanks for coming in today, Melvin. Good morning, Lucy. Thank you for having me as well. Uh, So Chief Foley, uh, when people hear about drones, of course, they're interested in how they're going to be used. So with the purchase of two drones possibly being uh, used later this year, uh, what's the plan for the Hartford Police Department and how they will be used? So, uh, but let me first say that uh, everything that uh, you, that Ben had mentioned, Baltimore police did, uh, we're not going to do. That's good. Uh, <laughs> all, everything that he mentioned, basically, and, and I hate to beat up on Baltimore, but we've been using them as an example of uh, what not to do for a long time. I, I go to their Twitter site right now. And look at what they put up there. They put up mug shots of the people they arrest, and it's brown people. And how are you, you know, their, their, their relationship with the community has been strained. I know they're trying to improve it, but it's just such slow going. And, and we've got to watch departments around the country watch and learn from their mistakes. But let me tell you, the drone thing for, uh, and this started years, uh, probably a year or two ago for us, it started with the police pursuits. For me, in my heart, when I said, you know, I think we can fix this. And police pursuits are going to be cured through technology someday. And that someday is rapidly approaching. And you have high-speed pursuits. You have car thefts out there. You have people that die in our streets from auto thefts and kids, kids, kids driving these cars. And when police try to pull them over, they run. And that creates a deadly situation. In my heart, I thought, you know, someday we're going to be able to avoid this and just be able to use a drone the way other cities use helicopters. Uh, the drones, though, they, they're, or um, unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, are they, the fly time's not nearly as long as, as a helicopter does. So um, there would be some, as technology catches up, it wouldn't be as effective. But if it saves lives, that's, all, that's what we want to use it for, in my heart. Now, let's look at large-scale events, concerts, marathons, uh, security protections, uh, let's look at active shooter situations. Um, let's look at, again, crime scene reconstruction. The three-year-old kid that wanders out of the house at 2 in the morning, which we see so often here uh, in the city, unfortunately. Uh, these are the types of scenarios we, we want to use it for. The types of scenarios we don't want to use it for, specifically surveillance, specifically Weaponize. These are things we absolutely don't want to do. We don't want the military products. We don't want anything that, that Uncle Sam has uh, to sell to us. We're fine with uh, approaching it with our citizens. We've been saying it for probably, probably a year now at community meetings, at our NRZ meetings. I was at NRZ meeting last night. We talked about it. Uh, we haven't heard one complaint or concern about the, about the use of these, uh, these vehicles in these NRZ meetings. Not one. Uh, so, in, in fact, they, they, the, what we hear so much is they, they would probably want us to use them more, but we don't. And we understand that, you know, there's some level of distrust with the police department. There's scars. There are scars in our community. There's scars with the community and the police relationships. And because of that, you have organizations like the ACLU to keep us in check. Uh, we embrace that and we appreciate it. And in the end, it's going to make us all do our jobs better. Are the drones being used right now? No, we haven't even bought them yet. Now the paperwork's uh, still still in, in uh, still being created. Uh, policy is is uh, drafts are written. Mm-hmm. Our policy, but our policy is very specific in a lot of the stuff I just mentioned and more. Mm-hmm. And we plagiarized much of the uh, ACLU's language uh, in, right into our uh, policy as they stated. Let's bring in the ACLU of Connecticut uh, because uh, this organization has been outspoken about uh, the fact that there are no local or state guidelines in the state of Connecticut with how police departments should be using uh, drone technology. So Melvin Medina, again, welcome to the show. Uh, So we heard from Deputy Chief uh, Brian Foley about how they would like to use these drones and how they don't want to use it for for surveillance. Uh, But the ACLU wants to see some guidelines on paper that that gives rules to the cops on how they should use them, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to unpack there, I think, in what was just stated. Um, some that I agree with and some that I disagree with. I agree with the idea that police 
should find alternatives to engaging in high speed pursuits that result in in crashes and deaths. I think that I think everyone would agree on that. Um, but I think the the first thing we need to do is take a step back on the issues of drones to contextualize it as to to, to kind of draw out why the ACLU has so many concerns and not just the ACLU but community members as well. So the implementation of drones in the AC uh, and in Hartford as a city would be in conjunction with the real-time crime center that Hartford has set up, which is uh, a mass surveillance uh, center developed to, you know, have cameras across the city, um, used new police technology to kind of surveil communities. And I think uh, starting from that place, that gives a more that, that gives more context as to why we're concerned. Um, I think the th- there are, there are there are basic issues that we have. Um, the first is that the Hartford Police policy that has been drafted and that I was sent to me by a council person is not reflective of the ACLU's values. Um, they spend of their six page document, uh, they spend about four of those pages listing all the ways police can use drones, and one sentence about not ensuring that we don't use drones to you know, violate anyone's civil liberties. And I think that that's clearly not enough. The policy that the ACLU um, was worked alongside Councilwoman Bermudez to introduce to the city council listed uh, six specific ways that police can use drones and then uh, in all other circumstances and an inability to use those drones. And I think that that's a better place to start, uh, a more uh, strict, um, narrow use of the technology as opposed to a broad language that allows them to use it in any scenario they'd like. Uh, Chief Foley, you mentioned that there is a di- distrust in local communities across this country when it comes to um, certain communities and the, the local police. So how will uh, more cameras around the city as well as the use of drones, you know, how will that, do you see that impacting the level of trust that Hartford residents have with their police department? We haven't felt that at all to this point. And he had mentioned, uh, uh, Melvin mentioned that we do have the real-time crime center with all the cameras. Uh, our retention of our video uh, exceeds what the ACLU had asked us to do and how long to, co- to store it. But bottom line is we don't have the staff nor the resources or money to store it longer. And so we were we were under what they wanted us to, 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 do, to use it for. Um, our crime center has been used for so many great things, and, and, and we haven't had any issues at all with privacy concerns. Everyone's protected by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, we've used the crime center cameras to catch child predators. We were able to use those cameras to go back weeks and show that this predator was grooming the child. Then we were able to use the, the cameras in real time to catch him as he had just tried to pick up a little girl and, and then escape. So, uh, yes, there is a level of distrust and there are scars, but I like to think Harford's a lot different than every other community. I think, I think even Melvin would agree our transparency and our outreach is better than every police department in this region, in our state. Uh, we we like to work with the ACLU. Again, we embrace our critics. We're not going to get better without people like the ACLU, without our council people uh, keeping us in check and in line. So uh, as we grow, I think there's a, a, a trust with each other. And, and you know, we get criticism in, in, in Copland for working closely with the ACLU. But you know what? We have to do it, and, and we're going to do it as we move forward. So uh, this will be a growing experience, uh, hopefully, and a relationship improvement for all of us. Uh, we do, we have noticed the trust with our community over the last five years as there's been a cultural change within our police department on how we approach our communities. Our relationships have improved uh, tremendously. We're recognized by the Obama administration for our outreach and, and our transparency and our trust. Uh, we're become, become a national model on how we handle demonstrations and how we handle protests. And we've become a national model on how we handle communications during times of critical incidents with police. So uh, I believe we are different, but I can tell people that all day long. It doesn't matter. You know, people, people still have perceptions. That's the reality. And we're just going to keep working to improve that. Uh, if you live in, in the city of Hartford and if you're aware of this program, we want to hear from you. The number 860-275-7266. We just have a couple of minutes before we head to break. Uh, we're going to continue to talk about this when we head come back from the break. I did want to go back to something you said, uh, Chief Foley. You mentioned that uh, the Fourth Amendment will be respected. So these drones aren't going to be peering into the windows of homes. Is that what you're trying to say? We have cameras all around the city. We have policies very specifically against that. Uh, no, they will not be used for surveillance, period. And even if, let's say it's somebody down the road, they change policy and they do want to use them for surveillance, 
information obtained there would still be subject to a search warrant and used. If, if we arrest somebody based on that information, it's going to go through a warrant. It's going to go before a judge, period. Uh, but we're not going to do that. That, that. That's the last thing. Look, at, we have no problem finding drug, drug dealers and drugs transactions, and, and I don't think we need a drone to go and do that. Uh, and so we're, that is not in our plans. Our plans are to use this for good. I understand we need policies in place, hard written policies in place. Uh, we embrace that, and, let, and I hopefully I'm pretty sure we can come to an understanding. Melvin, I want to go to you. We have got about a minute. I just want you to respond to what Chief Foley has said. So I think that there's there's just no way that you couldn't call a camera system that's throughout the entire city with the potential of adding re- facial recognition technology that is active. Not going to use facial recognition. Well, that's not necessarily what Chief Ravella before he left. We're not going to do it. To him. Um, and I, I think that the fact that there's active recording and to not call that surveillance is 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 a, is a weird choice, I guess. Um, I, I will say that I think that there are there are opportunities to get this right, and I think that from the ACLU's perspective, what that looks like is restoring community control over these decisions. And so I do think that the city council made the first step, the right step, to introduce an ordinance to get a handle on this, as opposed to. Uh, leaning on only administrative policy. We need these policies to be put into law uh, to, pr- to protect the community. And I think if Hartford Police Department is willing to do that, then sure, we're on the same side. And you're referencing legislation that uh, City Councilwoman Wildeliz Bermudez has been working with the ACLU on. And Chief Foley, this is something that uh, the police department is open to working with to draft a policy before these drones go out on the streets. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's a work in progress right now. Uh, we uh, we work very closely with council. Uh, mo- many of them are, are, are friends, and so uh, we have to establish trust. And it's based on history that there is this lack of distrust. We're willing to to hopefully knock that down. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking about drone use by local police departments. Again, later this year, the Hartford Police Department will be using two drones purchased through a straight state grant to be used for addressing quality of life issues. In studio with me, Deputy Chief Brian Foley, also Melvin Medina from the ACLU of Connecticut. We'll be back after the break. First, it's our spring fun drive. Support the conversations you hear on where we live. Here are two of my colleagues to tell you how. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking about drones, specifically how law enforcement is using and exploring this technology. Now, Amazon made a big splash in 2013 when it announced it wanted to to deliver the stuff you buy by using drones. But does your perception of drones change when considering how the military and now local law enforcement is using the surveillance technology? We want to hear from you. Join the conversation at 860-275-7266. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. In studio with me is Brian. Brian Foley, Deputy Chief of the Hartford Police Department, and Melvin Medina, Director of Strategic Initiatives at the ACLU of Connecticut. And I want to welcome into our conversation now Dan Gettinger, Co-Director of the Center for the Study of the Drone at Bard College. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I understand your center uh, published a, a report in 2017 looking at drone use by first responders around the country. What did you find? Well, yes, we published basically a database of all public safety departments that we could find that had acquired drones. And we found that the number of departments that are acquiring drones increased dramatically in 2017 or 2016, uh, and it continues to rise. Um, That doesn't, we didn't necessarily look at the applications for drones, but just at the acquisitions, and that's uh, on the rise. And when we're looking at police departments and others buying specifically uh, drones, what kinds of drones? Because we started the show talking about, you know, very uh, high-tech extreme example um, used in the city of Baltimore, uh, created by like military-grade technology. And then you have uh, the the drones that you might be able to buy at, say, a Best Buy. What kind of drones are police departments buying? Yeah, the vast majority of these systems are the same types of systems that consumers use around the country. So most of them are the popular DJI Phantom model. Uh, We also see the DJI Inspire, which is a prosumer model, a sort of more expensive uh, Phantom, if you will. Um, But these are not, for the most part, military-grade systems. Most of these are are pretty recognizable to most people. And that's because a lot of departments are constrained in terms of their funding. Uh, So a lot of these come from donations or uh, forfeiture, drug forfeiture funds. So, but most of these are pretty recognizable systems. 
Now, when we look at these conversations happening around the country, and specifically here in uh, Connecticut, we're talking about the city of Hartford uh, using uh, two drones later this year uh, to address uh, what they call quality of life issues. Uh, I'm just curious how other police departments, what has your uh, center found and how other communities are looking at the way drones are being used and some of the debates surrounding them? Yeah, I think the for the most part, there isn't that much controversy around the police use of drones. I think a lot of police departments recognize that part of the issue with acquiring drones is that you have to engage in a pretty uh, wholehearted uh, community relations effort to um, educate the public as to how these systems will be used and the policies surrounding them. We have seen some controversies in larger um, urban areas, such as Seattle, Los Angeles, where there is some concern about surveillance. Um, But I think the variety, the types of applications that police and law enforcement generally intend to use drones for uh, are pretty limited at the moment in terms of, you know, search and rescue, uh, crime scene investigation, um, and that those types of sort of uh, narrower focused applications. So we haven't seen so much um, outcry except for in some larger urban areas. Now, the ACLU here in Connecticut and others have raised that, uh, and I think for the last few years now, even uh, legislation before our state legislature to come up with guidelines uh, dealing with drone use by law enforcement. There are no state uh, laws on the books yet in Connecticut. Are there other uh, parts of the country that are being more proactive with setting up a policy before the purchase of these drones? Yes, absolutely. There's a number of states that have adopted uh, laws regarding police and law enforcement use of these systems, um, including as well as a number of small localities. Uh, But uh, for the most part, I mean, there's no federal regulation governing the use of these systems. There is some federal or nationwide guidance from uh, law enforcement organizations uh, as to the policies to adopt when you're acquiring one of these systems. Um, But there has been some activity on the state level around the country Uh, to uh, develop uh, regulations for law enforcement use of these systems. You can join the conversation, 860-275-7266, as we talk about uh, law enforcement using drone technology. Uh, Josh is calling from Hartford. Josh, welcome to the show. Hi. um, I'm a public defender, actually, and so my concern is perhaps obvious, but something that I've found, and I know my colleagues find, is that when there's surveillance, or recordings that help the police in a prosecution, they tend to turn up very easily. And when there's things that might show police misfeasance or might exonerate folks, they're much harder to get at. So I wonder if there's going to be any um, independent non-police oversight of the keeping of all these recordings in Hartford so that folks can get at them without the police as gatekeeper. Uh, Good question, Josh. I'll go back to Deputy Chief uh, Brian Foley. Again, I I understand the policy is still in process, but how do you respond? Uh, Our transparency is you'd be hard pressed. You live in you live in Connecticut, I assume, as a as a public defender in Connecticut. You'd be hard pressed to find any police department that's more transparent uh, and open to us, open than, than we are here in the city of Hartford. Uh, as far as, as accessing the video, uh, we've had bad incidents involving police officers uh, where we've invited the community down the next day, the NAACP, the Urban League, faith-based leaders, to look at the video, to listen to the audio, and see what happened and to show them what we had. Uh, when good things happen, we want everybody to know about it. When bad things happen, we really want people to know about it as well. We, we've released pictures uh, in critical incidents with, with poli- with involving police officers, uh, sometimes not in, in in accordance with the state's attorney's office, with the prosecutor's office. But, you know, we felt that it was best to be open to our community first. We are beholden to the city. We are beholden to our community. Uh, and we have to think about protecting them first and foremost. Melvin Medina. Yes. Yeah, so I think, um, well, the, to Josh's question, I think that's the importance of uh, dem- democratic control of policing. People should be at uh, at the table deciding what tools are being used, how they'll be used, um, how that information will be stored. Uh, I, I, I commend the Hartford Police Department on its strategic crisis communications, which I think is what Brian just was referring to. Um, but what we're talking about in terms of transparency, a very different thing. I'll give you an example. Like on this show, Brian just said that the police department won't be taking on facial recognition technology. Yet I'm looking at a letter from Bronin's office 
to the city council that Mayor says, Bronin. Mayor Bronin, I apologize, that says specifically the grant will be used to integrate analytical software into the camera system. This software will allow the discovery, interpretation, and communication of meaningful patterns in the data collected by the system. These patterns will be helped to will help to predict crime, uh, collect evidence of crimes, and apprehend the perpetrators who can also provide information to commercial enterprises and so forth. When you Google that information, when you Google the word uh, or the words uh, integrated analytical software into security systems, all you will find is facial recognition software. So I, I it's it's not necessarily an issue of transparency. It's just I'm I'm still unclear as to what the police department is doing. Chief Foley. Every day, not every day, a couple times a week, I'm approached by facial recognition software companies. Every time I turn them away. It's, it's, not, it's not going to happen in this policy, uh, n- not as long as I'm here. We have no intent on putting facial recognition software on here. There's facial recognition software out there. It's in social media. It, it's out there. And you're being surveilled. Uh, and it's not by the police. And we all found that through this political election that I don't, I'm, not, I'm pretty sure we've taken a backseat to who's watching us. Uh, but that doesn't mean we still have, don't have to keep ourselves in check. Uh, Melvin, I'm telling you, we're not going to put facial recognition software on these drones. Uh, I, that's I, I can only give you my word, and, and we can probably write I, it I into the policy. I don't mean just the drones, though. I also mean just the surveillance center itself. I think that's an important distinction. We're not just only talking about drones. That's not our intent and not something we're looking at. People, I don't think our citizens want that. I really don't think they want that. Uh, you look, you know, airports and such. Maybe they they should have it, uh, but but our citizens don't want that. There's been no outcry for us to get facial recognition software, I mean, and I'm sure some of the police departments around the country would disagree. Uh, I can only listen to what our city tells us. Now, Chief Foley, you did uh, raise the point that as long as you're here, that you wouldn't use uh, facial recognition technology. But I think that's the crux of the problem right. is there's no guidelines, rules in place. Right. No matter if uh, Mayor Bronin leaves or if you're no longer with the police department, who comes in after and what, what policies they put in place? And that's why, you know, when we upgrade software, um, those things should be uh, vetted through uh, a process when we do do put different softwares on, on different things uh, uh, so it should go through the city, and, and we don't have a problem with that. Well, I, I think I want, I want to add to that. I mean, I think it's more than just a process or administrative policies. Again, going back to the idea or the concept that the community should be in control of its police. That is that is a guideline that is in city charter. Uh, sworn officers have their power because the community has given them that power. And so oversight communities are the only way, and ordinances and state laws are the only ways that we really can get a control over this. I, I will say, too, that I think what's most concerning about uh, the surveillance center is that they re- just received a $2.5 million quality of life grant. Uh, $1.8 million of of that grant is undesignated. We don't actually know what the police department's use, using it for. Uh, the ACLU has uh, sent open le- open records requests to the Harvard Police Department. We have not been given a response. We don't. We know that city council members don't know what that money is being used for, and it's not clear that the Brown administration is making it very clear what they intend to use that money for. What we know and what we heard from Chief Rosado is that a hundred thousand dollars per drone is what is going to be used to purchase two drones, so $200,000. So what does that mean? That means that we're not talking about Best Buy consumer products. We're talking about high-level military-grade drones. Um, and I don't think, at least I'm a Hartford resident, and I have not been given that information outside of a stakeholder meeting that I was in. And so when we talk about transparency, this is part of the problem. I'll so, let you respond, and I want to go back to Dan. Okay. So uh, the drones are about uh, $100,000 each year accurate, and I thought that was a lot of money and that was an expensive drone. I went to drone training down in Florida, uh, and when I mentioned this is how much I was spending, they laughed and said that's not a lot of money to be spending on these things. Furthermore, there's free drones coming back from overseas right now from Uncle Sam. We're not interested in buying them. Uh, the money we're spending, this is not taxpayer money, but $200,000 are for drones. What I've been told the rest of the way the money is $500,000 will go to the D- Department of Public Works for speed tables. Uh, around the city. Uh, $500,000 will go towards the community partnership where people will give us access to their security cams around their homes uh, by permission only uh, when we can use it. And then another $500,000 will go towards a software called uh, Brief Cam, uh, which we used, which is the software we used to catch a predator probably six months ago that was that tried to pick up a girl and we were able the one I, I explained earlier uh, so I, I want to say that's that's right around the two two million I'm not sure I mean I'm, I'm rounding numbers down as I, as I just had a brief conversation last night 
uh, where's this money coming from, but the, the vast majority of it is not going towards um, our drills. This is where we live. I wanted to go back to Dan Gettinger, co-director of the Center for the Study of the Drone at Bard College. Uh, Dan, we touched on uh, trends among law enforcement uh, to uh, continue to buy uh, drones, and uh, Chief Foley here in Hartford just mentioned that um, there are uh, equipment that comes from the military that are that are accessible to police departments if they want them. Is that a concern as we look to the future of drone technology across this nation? Yeah, that's interesting because, uh, well, during the Obama administration, they placed a prohibition on transferring uh, unmanned aircraft from the military under what's called the 1033 program to local law enforcement. There were robots, uh, unmanned ground vehicles that were transferred under this program. We've ha- we've been tracking that separately, um, and that may change with the new administration. Um, but certainly what we've seen mostly are uh, multi-rotor quadcopter-type systems, uh, the types of systems that the military would be transferring to uh, local law enforcement would be fixed-wing systems. And those systems have a much longer endurance. They could usually carry a heavier payload. Um, so that would definitely change the game in terms of what types of systems we're talking about um, if those systems were adopted by local law enforcement. The types of applications, for the most part, that local law enforcement are seeking to use drones for, um, they don't really, fixed-wing systems wouldn't necessarily be the greatest fit for those types of applications. But certainly if we saw a large transfer of fixed-wing systems from uh, the military to local law enforcement, that would definitely change the picture in terms of the uh, types of applications and uh, that uh, law enforcement could use these systems for. And then uh, just real quickly, Dan, we did hear from a listener earlier in the hour who wants to know what legal rights does a property owner have if uh, there's a drone chase above uh, their house? If there's an accident with the drone, who's held responsible? Right. Um, well, uh, um, I'm not not too familiar with that uh, specific aspect of uh, of drone use, but I would, you know, there are laws governing existing laws governing um, how how close and what types of equipment law enforcement can can use. I think the chief can speak to this better than I can uh, when they're uh, around private property. Um, but um, I'm not familiar with uh, with how what happens if a drone crashes, for example, uh, in someone's yard. I think. You know, the, for the most part, uh, law enforcement have to abide by the same rules as any other drone user, um, and that means not flying the drone out of the line of sight of the officer or the person piloting. Um, so there's there is some limitations already that that apply generally uh, to drone um, flights. Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Dan Gettinger, co-director of the Center for the Study of the Drone at Bard College. Thank you so much, Dan. Also, Deputy Chief Brian Foley with the Hartford PD and Melvin Medina with the ACLU of Connecticut. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Garnet McLaughlin. If you appreciate these kinds of conversations, and I'm sure we'll be talking about drones in the future, uh, if, if you appreciate WMPR, support this program now. Here are two of my colleagues to tell you how.